Hey, Matt Sitter here, CEO of AFN. At AFN, our central belief is that change is where opportunity happens. And the best way to find opportunity in change is a network that's diverse in experience, expertise, and perspective. Part of what we try and do is bring unique perspectives to the fore. Therefore, for all of us to be able to learn from, that's what's behind our fireside chats. Uh, today, we're going to be talking with Carl Sanders Edwards, Adaption, CEO's Adaption, or, uh, CEO of Adaption. Uh, global leadership development firm. And uh, you've been doing this for a really long time, Carl. We're excited to be able to dig into how you think about leadership development in general for organizations, as well as some of the things that you're doing to uh, to make your own company work well. So welcome. Great to be here. Thanks, mate. Uh, the first thing I wanted to start out with, because leadership development, I think that everyone's been through courses at their companies where they've got to take training and things like that. I would say just you know, what do you see as your philosophy on leadership development? And I think inherent in this is what are some companies doing wrong? How are they thinking about it incorrectly? The um, good question. The, I, 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 you put me off with the what are companies doing wrong. Um, <laughs> Save that for later. Save that for later. Yeah. But maybe the philosophy does actually come from how we got into it in the first place and um this isn't necessarily the big why but the the how was is um we've been working in business you know not doing leadership development or hr or training even at all trying to get large complex things done whether it was building software or um changing the strategy of an organization and um, a lot of those were facilitated processes where you'd get a group of people together and they'd come up with a great plan and a great response to some sort of situation. And with good group facilitation processes, you know, you'd always end up with something that people were really jazzed about. And then they would go and go off and have to implement it. And like lots of other but we weren't researching, we were practitioners, but like a lot of researchers had found, you'd come back in three months, six months, a year, and 50% of the time or more, nothing had happened. And and despite all of the energy and despite something being co-created, um, the changes hadn't been made. And um, I was like really interested in this whole area, particularly with strategy and, and how to execute on, on great ideas. And uh, was also a bit horrified by the low hit rate. And that kind of led to quite a lot of research and um, interviews and, and it ended up in this place of like, well, underlying underlying this, you could almost tell with a group before you even started this sort of strategy planning process or the big initiative or the big project, whether there was a chance of success or not. And it was um, in the stance or mindset of the people involved in the room. And you kind of very broadly, there was... There was a there was a sense of being reactive to the world, and um, it's happening to me regardless. And if that was the underlying mindset, it didn't stand a chance. It didn't matter how excited everyone was at the end of the day. But if there was this sort of proactive, I've got some agency and control, and and we've got some ability to influence the way that things happen here, then you know more often than not, there'd be a, um, a fantastic result a few months later, and things would happen, and and there'd be some learning. So got me really interested in, and initially we started looking at leadership development firms to partner with, and maybe this is this is the second part of your question, because we thought we could do the strategy planning and this kind of create these great initiatives process, join up with a leadership development firm to get the mindsets in place to actually make it possible to deliver on this, because it's the it wasn't so much the technical how-to or what to do challenges. It was more the adaptive mindset related ones where you had to deal with um, lots of tricky things and you couldn't just be told what to do. That was holding things up was this underlying mindset. And so, um, and then I thought that would be a really, really powerful, we thought that would be a really, really powerful way of, um, of being able to support change and make some meaningful progress. And in that process, um, discovered that a lot of, a lot of leadership development and probably it's probably unfair in some ways, but especially more highly scaled leadership development didn't really address 
um, the stuff it needed to address. It was more kind of like teaching people things and saying, here's what you need to know versus people doing things and behaving in certain ways. And there was a couple of, there came across a quote around that time and it's like, it said it's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than think your way into a new way of acting. It's been attributed to a number of different people, but it was Richard Pascal, I think, was the one that we picked up on. And that became the underlying tenant of our leadership development work. It was like you, it's very much like exercise. It's somewhat helpful watching a video or hearing somebody tell you about what exercises you need to do. And it's, you know, it's not, it's not, there's no value in it. But unless you go and exercise, you're not going to get fitter, stronger, healthier. You need to do it. It's just, there's just no, no way around it. And so um, that is the absolute underlying bedrock of our philosophy and approach to leadership development. It's um, it's a verb. Uh, you know, leadership is something that you can show in one moment, and not in another. So you never stop working on it. Um, you can't go and do a course on it and be good at it. It's something that you need to keep practicing, doing. It is an act and a practice um, rather than a position, something that you know. And so that's the, I mean, I could go on more about how we do it, but that's the the underlying bedrock of it. And you talk about the problems, you know, where it's wrong. I think um, that's underestimated. We overestimate content and knowledge and underestimate the behavior and the practice. I think that's totally fair. And there's been a over- the years that I've known you, there's a couple of things that have really like lodged in my head well, which I think are good for other people to understand. Um, one of the things that you have said to me in the past is talking about where leadership development has been focused specifically on who we think about as leaders. And you talked a little bit about like when you're looking at job descriptions, what you see in a leader's job description versus what you see in an individual contributor's job description. So would you mind speaking to that just a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it's like, so the, 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 this comes from the, I, sa I said earlier that it's probably a little bit unfair because there's a lot of leadership development that is done fantastically well and it doesn't over-index on content, it does on behaviour and on practice and reflection, and um, but it's generally very unscalable. It's sort of coaching or highly bespoke work that's done with executive teams and it really works and, um, and there's plenty of people that know that and do it fantastically well. Um, the thing is, is that like, you know, if we think of how organizations operate today and the way that hierarchies have broken down, people are like, I'm working at home at the moment. There's no manager or mentor beside me that can give me feedback or I can ask, you know, their opinion on how that meeting ran. So a lot of the, um, the sort of underlying structures that we had around work have changed. Um, there's a lot more technologies now that do sort of easier jobs. So the, the thing is that what is developed or taught in this executive or highly unscalable leadership development is now pretty much required by everyone. And um, we've gotten rid of a lot of the jobs that don't require a high degree of proactivity in your own mindset, dealing with ambiguity, making decisions without full information, moving forward and learning from what happens. Because if, it's, if it doesn't require that, then, you know, somebody else is doing it or it's being automated or things have been leveled out. And so from that point of view, leadership development scope, I think, has become vastly wider. It needs to. And it's um we we often talk about it being it's more really human development. And which is which is a good thing. And so those stats were was it, it was an organization we were partnering with and they looked at job descriptions and they looked at the uh attributes and things that their senior executives um had to deal with and was required of them versus individual contributors in the same organizations, 100,000 people plus in this organization. And it was it was like a 70% overlap. Um, so at the end of the day, they, was, they were saying, like, we're asking the same things of these humans, these people. We, we, we're, the, the, the boardroom isn't that different from the front line. It's really not when it comes down to behaviorally, mindset-wise. And yet, you know, they're investing a lot in development and support for that executive group and nothing for the other groups. And so um, that I think is something that we're seeing worldwide across a lot of different organizations. Um, so it means that there's a real big challenge in leadership development about how do we do it? How do we apply what we know really works and works well at the executive level for everyone and, and make that available um, so that it's, so that we can, because people need it, 
you know, it's really important for the for our jobs and our and um and the quality of them, but also just how well we deal with it as people and our mental health and those things as well. Um, yeah, so this is, I mean, it's a very, you brought up a hard number, 70% overlap, right? You can do statistical analysis. This was actually something that like is, you could, you could just see if you were looking in the right place for it. When you say that to organizations, how surprised are they by it? Um, not very most of the okay. time not very not very at all i mean there's a bit of um you know there's a bit of bias in that though because i'm probably not talking to organizations that are a bit interested in this idea of scaling high quality leadership development okay. so that's okay. one of the things that we, yeah. we sort of put out there so but yeah i mean it's one of the, it's um the it doesn't seem a big leap at all and there's a lot of um if anything sometimes i get surprised it's only 70 percent okay so people, you know because people know and they see it they're just like how the heck are we going to do this if this is you know do we just have to hire better people you know that's that's harder to come by than you know building the skills internally yeah it is and the thing is is that um because of some of those other changes in the way that organizations work some of the, i think some of the natural developmental enablers or conditions that were in place have been removed and it's nobody's fault i mean it's like uh you learn a lot from people around you um after leaving a meeting you know that casual conversation that is actually a reflective practice about what do you think happened there oh they were coming at it from this point of view that's actually realizing that other people see the world in different ways that you see and you can have a conversation with your peer about that but when you're moving from one zoom meeting to another that opportunity is lost yeah. Yeah. Um, and so a natural developmental moment isn't happening by accident anymore or as much uh as you were talking before about the difference between you know thinking in yourself into a new way of acting versus acting yourself into a new way of thinking um one of the, another one of the things that you and I have talked about in the past is is rumination, right? And so, like you know, this idea of you know, if you're overly ruminating on something, I think this connects very strongly to that idea of thinking yourself into a new way of acting. You know, rumination is one of these things that is that presents a challenge for folks that is a symptom of something else. Can you talk just a little bit about how you know what adaption does relates to how we think about rumination and where we want to be driving people towards. Um, well, it's quite, yeah, for sure. I mean, ruminate, rumination is the idea of just thinking over and over about something endlessly and, and attaching negative emotions to it. And it's sort of, there's all sorts of things that it's unhelpful for, unhelpful for and what it does for us. And it's also sort of something that we um, need to be quite mindful of not doing. And one of the, maybe one of the reasons that we, that we tend to it so much as it's a very very close cousin of something that's really helpful which is reflection which is um which is reflecting about how something went and then making a plan forward and moving on from it and so what we do with adeption is we sort of we spend a lot of time talking about reflection and having simple questions to help guide reflection um and share your reflections with others and then move that reflection into curiosity and from that curiosity, which naturally does, it sort of like primes your brain. If you reflect on what went well and what didn't go well, it starts activating curiosity. And it goes right down to the way that um, that um, circuitry in our brains are primed to then take content in differently because we reflected on what was good and bad about the particular situation that we had. So then the content that we look at means something different than what it would if we hadn't gone through that reflective process first. With that curiosity, we can then move to action to go, okay, what can I do about this? Which is back to that behavior. Um, and then following, trying something with a bit of deliberateness about it. Um, so we've borrowed a lot of, uh, it was Anders Ericsson did the original research around deliberate practice and sort of codifying that. So bringing that into a leadership context, what am I going to deliberately try? I'm going to make some predictions about what will happen or not and then reflect again after action. So it completes that whole learning loop. Um, we've got a whole methodology that's built around it, but it's it's interesting because it's a close. Many of those things I just mentioned there are quite, you know could be closely related to rumination, and yet it's so different. Um, right, right. And it's yeah. 
Excellent. Um, well, and I, I think you alluded to this a little bit earlier, thinking about like, okay, Adaption's a global firm. Um, you guys are focused on leadership development on a scale fashion, but just thinking there's vastly different cultures throughout the world. And how are we seeing leadership considered in a different way or where are we seeing it similarly for these places so that we can think about like, all right, you know, you're, we, we all have to work in a global environment. What does this mean for different cultures that we're operating with? Uh, great question. I mean, there's a, we've got our, our own organization, obviously, as well, which which makes that um, a really interesting question. And then there's the participants or the leaders that we, that we work with within it. Um, there's a few things that I find really interesting in it. One is I think that as humans, the things that, unify us and that we have in common are like this and the things that separate us are like this we tend to focus on the separate things it's easy to and like and it's also respectful to often too it's like it's a good thing like you know we want to celebrate those differences but you know you, you do this work and humans are humans you know it's really interesting that um and we and it's easy to kind of make excuses and over index on some of those differences that are definitely true to cultural differences and things and um and how what people value but I think a lot of um, social psychologists would agree with me as well. You know, there's a lot that unifies us and you can go a long way on those sorts of things. Um, honestly, at the moment, the thing that that question makes me think that some of the, the tougher things across that we deal with across the globe are sort of technical things like time zones and, um, and just managing uh, remotely and working in a remote first organization because that's the, then all of a sudden those things that unify us and that we're the same about are unifying uh, are all tricky <laughs> tricky for us all it would be um and i think from a from a leadership and a management point of view as well at management in there it's um i my, my I said this for quite some time and um it became really apparent when covid sort of sent everyone into a remote first environment as well i think working across lots of time zones and remotely is a magnifier so if you do things really well you're going to get a lot of payback for it like good one-on-ones you deliberately connect with people it really has an outsized impact but the tolerance for getting away with some things that don't go so well is also a lot narrower so if you make some mistakes, miss people, talk over the top of people. There aren't as many other opportunities around it to kind of like have people see the real you and excuse you for those sorts of things as a person, as a leader. So the margin for error is a lot smaller as well. And so I kind of don't want to label it as bad leadership, but if you were to say like bad leadership is worse in a remote environment yeah. or a globally dispersed environment. So you sort of got, it's a, it's a, <clears throat> it's a bigger, um, amplitude that we're sort of dealing with. No, I, I think that makes a world of sense. And so you guys are on three continents um, and experience that time zone difference yourselves. Uh, how do you keep your organization on the same, ideally you're doing the, the good leadership that we talked about, but how are you keeping yourselves <laughs> on the same page around that and making sure that that is really embedded as a cultural value because you know if you're going to be a global leadership firm, you got to be able to work separately. So how do you deal with that problem yourself? Um, it's been a bit of a journey. Like I've uh, I took origin. I, I've taken quite a lot of inspiration from thinking about organisations as metaphors and thinking about it, um, some uh, some people who watch this might. Be, uh, Frederick LaRue wrote a book, uh, this book called um, Reinventing Organizations. And so sort of thinking about some of the different ways that you can run the company to help uh, help with what you just mentioned. And one I earlier on have was really strongly focused on a kind of relational glue. So as far as keeping people on the same page, when we have things like town halls, um and weekly meetings the focus was mostly on relationship and building 
um, relational glue between people because it wasn't there accidentally. So people would call and have a meeting about a topic, about a client, about a problem, about a product, and you'd deal with that particular piece of work. But you wouldn't have any, um, you wouldn't go have a coffee together and just talk and build that relational glue. And that relational glue makes the work when you have to do it a lot easier because you kind of have this deeper understanding of each other. So for quite a long time in our evolution, that was the primary focus. Um, and then we just, it, it's changed a little bit and it's it, um, and it's been a really interesting thing to think about as we've got a bit bigger, that almost became overplayed, that relational focus. And there was a lot of relationships and a lot of discussions and a lot of one-on-ones happening, which in many ways are good and, and healthy, but there wasn't quite enough clarity about like, what is the story, the single story. And, you know, all of those relationships did what human relationships do and they make up stories and they start yeah, right. having their own things. So it's been an interesting, um, and, a, and it's, 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 it's been an interesting sort of evolution and process to sort of start thinking, no, now we need to put a little bit more formal structures in place um, just to improve uh, flows of information and um, that, and it's like, I almost feel like this is like counter to what a leadership development person should say, but you know, a little bit more formal wiring and a little bit yeah, more yeah. Um, of those more traditional things that you'd see in a in an organisation, and um, and without losing the relational piece. So that's kind of the the way we're thinking about it. So now um, there is you know more hard information shared. There's more structured agendas uh, and there's a very deliberate management system within regions, which cascades up to a global area and then information okay. flows back down. So yeah, some of the things that people might see naturally, you know, you're having to make it more formal so that they can, so it's easier for them to see if they're not looking it straight in the face. Um, Absolutely. I mean, when you talked about that relational glue, does it require specific meetings this is our relational glue meeting or is it something that's embedded in all the interactions that you get like or some combination between how do you think about that a bit of both yeah it's a good one we have a, um a, a bit of both like the we've we use a check in check out process for every meeting and so like the who is facilitating it which is a formal role so we assign that um comes up with a check in question and the main purpose behind that is that everyone gets a chance to speak in the first few minutes of the meeting and that just creates a a, a sort of a social norm then and a lot of relational glue is shared through that because you know you have different people come up with really interesting questions to get people to check in it might have been a highlight from the week or it might have been what you did on the weekend or it might have been something you've learned recently and so there's a lot of um, reciprocity and sharing happens with that and then the checkout too as well ten, tends to be somewhat of a lesser degree because it's um, it's more about like what what's your takeaway from the interaction that we just had. So they tend okay. to be focused more on work. We have monthly town halls that were until recently, re recently almost entirely about that relational glue um, and spending time together and learning about things. We've, and that's one that we've added a bit more formal information to. In saying that, though, the evolution continues because um, we now have added another process which provides a bit more of that formal information, which has reduced the load on the town hall. So we can add a bit more of the relational part into okay. the town hall's okay. back in and actually design that back in. And they have high attendance rates and you know people really enjoy them. And, and we do expect that as much as possible people come. Okay, so the, you know you're you're maximizing consumption of the relational glue rather than the stuff that people could just read. Let's say true. And what happens is when you have those moments with the relational glue, too, you can refer to the stuff that's being read because you know just because it can be read doesn't mean it is read. So right. you want to kind of yeah. like you know signal that it's really important to be read because if it's not read, you don't know what's happening. And right. um and that's right. when you know mistakes or misalignments can happen. So it's constant fine tuning. I guess the overriding theme of it is is that it's like it doesn't happen by accident, especially in a distributed global organization. Sure. Um, I you know going along the lines of your 
a little bit deeper in your managerial philosophy. And I know one of the things that's been important to you over time, just thinking about yourself as an entrepreneur and how you have attracted people in. And you've talked a lot about like what you, what you learned at Babson along the way and helping you think about how you're, how you're bringing people together. Can you tell us just a little bit on your managerial philosophy and how that plays into it? So um, the Babson example was is a really good one. They called it entrepreneurial thought and, and action. You probably got to say what Babson is for people. Just uh, yeah, so it's a small college in um, Wellesley, just out of Boston, and it's um, almost exclusively focused on entrepreneurship. So there's an undergraduate uh, school there, and the undergrads do all these amazing things and, and start businesses as part of it. It's just so what you do and the MBA program, which I was part of. I think there was 150 in my cohort, and we're from 50. So pretty small from 50 different countries it was 47. I think it was, it was, it was uh, over 40 in less than 50 countries. And I think 80% or so of us were running businesses at the same time. So this, this idea of entrepreneurship was deeply embedded. Um, and some of the research that they'd done was on, um, was on how entrepreneurs that end up successful really do things not like what experts say they do but what they really do and this just it was it's just stuck with me so much it's fascinating one was about building teams and so there's this kind of idea that you know great teams you think through carefully you define all the roles that you need and you say um this is what it's going it's like you know like a sports team you think of a sports team whereas um what they found was that um most entrepreneurs who created really successful teams had what were called self-selecting stakeholders so you had to tell people what you were trying to achieve and you had to like be open with that so a lot of people sort of think this is my idea i don't want to like let anyone know about it it's secret you'll steal my idea it's like you know <laughs> don't keep it secret get it out there um tell as many people as you can about what you're trying to do and if you don't have a team in six to 12 months that have just begging to join it and be part of it and, and want to join the cause, basically, then you've probably got a bad idea. <laughs> and, um, and take that as feedback and move on. But if you find yourself with, like, you know, people who, who want to come along and they're inspired and, they're, and they yeah. and they can contribute to it, then one way or another, they're great stakeholders to have. And I sort of think that that's, um, that's still an approach that we have is thinking about our team. It does, you know, you have to work out fit. And um, a couple of our current team members felt like they were on the world's longest internships. I think seven years is our current record um, <laughs> of being involved in an interested stakeholder before it became a full job. Um, but, you know, you don't, there's, there's clearly at that point, there's lots of commitment and buy-in and a lot of relationship in there as well. Right, right. Um, how'd you create those opportunities? Like you said, seven year internship. Okay. But what, what is, what does that mean in terms of the person feeling like they can, uh, start to opt in as a stakeholder? How do they do it? Uh, yeah, just conversations and relationship really is the key thing, but then, um, anything that, so that's the, that's the first one, but being open-minded and creative. So specifically, in those examples, going to some conferences and saying, hey, do you want to come? Do you want to be part of this? And um, and that was an easy, low barrier way of being involved. And uh, and they were like, yeah, I'd love to. That's great. And so then we got to spend time together, talk to potential clients, understand the market, all those things. So, um, one, one other question that I have for you as you're talking to organizations that you're working with, you know, when they're saying, you know, big, big companies and they're saying, all right, you know, we need your help on leadership development. Um, how are they measuring success in this area? And are they holding you accountable against the metrics that they're using to measure success? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a huge opportunity area in our space and there's still a lot of learning going on about it. So there's there's lots of, and I was in a call today, um, really big organization that's done a lot of work in measuring the success of leadership development. And so they cared, um, they cared quite a lot about uh, 
application success measures whether people feel you know feel um that they are learning and growing whether they're deliberately taking action to do so and they're cross-referencing that against and this is a very good instance against engagement data so like is the is this leadership development and network having an impact on the engagement of the entire organization um are hard metrics improving as well like results-based metrics um financial is is, is obviously the the tip the, the tip but other ones such as um turnover and um customer satisfaction they are but that's that's kind of an outlier that's quite rare for an organization to do that level of measurement and start cross-referencing it against leadership development i wish more would because we spend a lot of time saying you should um but the most common one is did people like it or um pre and post assessment evaluations um as far as being held accountable and so assessments about like leadership effectiveness uh do people perceive those around them and do those around you perceive you as having improved how you lead and show up which is you know fairly there's quite a lot of validity in that as well as far as being held accountable to it I, we just saw some fascinating data recently that we talk a lot about the eco eco ecosystem so I mentioned earlier about the importance of scale and that's part of the ecosystem and the leadership development initiative that a vendor can come in or even an internal group can put together for their organization um more than the first research that was external that we saw was 40 percent of the impact of that is held by the one-up manager of the participants behavior it's got nothing to do like you could put together the best program in the world with all of the absolute world-class practices and if the one-up manager of the people who are in it are completely disengaged and not interested it wouldn't work and um we just got out we've just recently seen our own data which shows the number of times that a participant meets with their one-up manager and discusses the experience through the experience okay okay had the biggest biggest driver of the net promoter score of the participants view of the experience and like by a vast level and so the reason i say that is it's it's it is we do get held to account obviously and ultimately you know yeah. if, if people if people don't think it's good you don't get to keep doing it so we really really care right. Right. and um there is a very wide net around whether it's good or not and the impact that it has and the measures that you get out of it as well and so one of the back to the our approach on leadership development in general our opening line is always to include the one-up managers the one-up um the one-up supervisors of whoever's involved and they are part of the experience to some degree as well Maybe not the same whole thing but unless they're connected into it you're leaving the biggest lever that you've got for a great outcome on the table does it does it matter when you were looking at this data who initiates the conversation a and b are you so as you're thinking about program design does that mean that the the initiation of the conversation is just a part of the design it's we didn't look at who initiates no but it is part of the design it is part of the design so the data that we were looking at is people either did it or didn't they should have everyone should okay okay yeah, <laughs> it was their responsibility to do whether or not they did it was important okay interesting yeah and so the designs you can imagine vary but you take it out so that there's no option and it's just you have to turn up and, it, and the whole design doesn't work if you don't or it's and in this particular set it was a strongly recommended option there were guides given and there were things done but we didn't actually bring those people in together as part of it uh so one more question then i'll ask if there's any questions from anyone else um as you're looking out into the horizon you know things are things are changing everywhere what are some of the changes that you see coming to adaption and to the leadership development field in general and doesn't matter if you're happy sad scared excited you know just what are some of those changes that you're seeing the big one is our first slide had um this three bullet points and this the first one was that content's no longer the constraint um and so a lot of the time 
we sort of focus on content availability being what we need to solve for for people and that's been solved like really well okay. um and the second bullet was adaptive challenges and adaptive skills so like what what worked yesterday isn't necessarily going to help us tomorrow and so broadly it's just about every conversation i'm in um organizations are in a state of flux and massive transition and people's jobs are transitioning and the type of work that they do is changing like really significantly and so um this idea of building adaptive skills and sort of dealing with this level of change and sort of thriving ideally in that level of change um is i think the is, is a really big um is a really big macro thing that's happening and um and that's the um the big context i suppose within what that means for us as a as an organization and sort of what excites me about moving forward i think more and more organizations are moving to kind of um what do we sort of what uh was in a conference just talking to somebody a couple of weeks ago and they were like we've never had more demand for leadership development in our organization because of what i just said because it like helps yeah. you deal with all this complexity we've never had less resource centrally to provide it um and interestingly it's a big organization the business units and functions have never been more motivated and creating opportunities themselves for providing it so that's lending to i think a little bit of a, a, a sort of a and it's quite neat as a, a um a model of uh central teams creating like libraries of developmental resources and experiences yeah. that then are deployed and either at the individual level so somebody makes a choice themselves or at a functional level um, so you sort of get the best of both worlds. You get the best of the sort of enterprise view and picture, but without the complexity and cost potentially of that. So I think that's an interesting one. And then you can't have a conversation like this without talking about AI. Um, you know, it's changing the content landscape further. And um, there's a lot of really interest. We've been we've been innovating with with the technologies for quite a few years now, and there's some fascinating things being done. And um, in the space of personal development, leadership development, coaching, um, that's that's a real big disruptor, and um, I think it will continue to be. And it's uh, it's fun to see. There's things that go to work really well, and there's things that aren't. But that's well, we couldn't have this conversation that, right? without mentioning that. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Good deal. Uh, well, thanks, Carl. Great conversation. Really appreciate it. Likewise. Thanks, Matt. Cheers.